Hello, friends of Jungle Drum Radio. My name is Lars Schall. I am a freelance journalist from Germany, and I am now connected via Skype with Professor Graham McQueen, founder, founding director of the Center for Peace Studies at McMaster University in Canada. Hi, Graham. Hello, Lars. Uh, you have written a book that was published by Clarity Press in 2014, and the title is uh, The 2001 Anthrax Deception, The Case for a Domestic Conspiracy. The first question would be, why do you think the topic of the anthrax letter attacks that were taking place during October 2001 is still relevant today? Well, Lars, I suppose uh, there are a variety of ways of getting at this, but one thing would be to say the global war on terror is still very much with us. Uh, we see more and more terrorist attacks, in quotation marks, taking place all the time in the West, um, and we are being told we have to mobilize, we have to pass laws that further restrict our civil liberties, we have to prepare to mobilize our armed forces against this and that group, especially in the Middle East. So this, this whole, what I would call, global conflict framework called, uh, you know, the global war on terror is still alive, still vital, and therefore the founding acts of this global war on terror are still relevant. And the two most important founding acts of this phase of the war were in 2001 in the fall in the United States namely the 9-11 attacks and the anthrax attacks that came right after them. Now, the, the anthrax attacks, in my opinion, uh, are a, a crime that has not been solved. The FBI claims to have solved it, but their case is ridiculously weak. And that means that somebody or other attacked the U.S. Congress, you know, the legislative branch of government, with a weapon of mass destruction and they're still at large, they're still out there somewhere. Now that's a pretty big deal. So that, that's, those are a few of the reasons. The other th reason I would say we need to still study this is because the anthrax attacks do not stand by themselves. They are connected to the 9-11 attacks. I argue in my book that those two sets of attacks are really different parts of one single operation. And therefore, we have to bear in mind that if we can solve the anthrax attacks, we might be able to solve the 9-11 attacks. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us how the anthrax attacks were connected to 9-11? Yes. Well, first, though, Lars, I'd like to say that a lot of people, in fact, most people in the U.S., assumed initially that they were connected. So that's a good place to start. Because some, sometimes nowadays people think you're saying something terribly new and controversial when you say they were connected, but it was assumed they were connected. After all, these horrific 9-11 attacks happened, and then, um, as we subsequently discovered, people started sending out anthrax in letters about a week later. Well, it, it would seem natural that this is a kind of a one-two punch, you know. In other words, two phases of a single attack, and that the people who did 9-11 are now following up with phase two. That was assumed, <clears throat> and there was good reason to assume that. I mean, when people finally opened a couple of these uh, anthrax letters and read them, uh, <laughs> whoever wrote it was basically saying, we're the same guys who just attacked you on 9-11. You know, the date 9-11 is given right at the top of the letter, and then it goes on to say stuff like, you know, death to America, death to Israel, Allah is great, as well as various threats and, and so on. So, you know, uh, we know because of a poll that was taken that over half the U.S. population thought that al-Qaeda was the likely perpetrator of these attacks in October 2001. And so did, you know, the Department of Homeland Security and the White House and so on. So I, I think it's important to remember that. So what I'm trying to do is not come out with an outlandish new theory that these attacks were connected. I'm trying to reconnect what we initially assumed were connected. And the FBI is trying very hard to not let us connect them. All right? Yeah, I assume the media did uh, play a role in this, in connecting the anthrax attacks and 9-11. And so people can just go back and read the articles, 
right? That's correct. There were many articles. And, and again, the reasons seemed good. Uh, the anthrax letters seemed to come from the same regions of the country uh, where the, the 19 hijackers, so-called, uh, were known to have stayed. The same cities, mainly New York and Washington, were attacked in the anthrax attacks, as had been ta attacked previous, previously in the 9-11 attacks. And then, uh, really, there's a whole lot of evidence that I would call circumstantial, but, to me, convincing. That is, when you get enough circumstantial evidence, it can become convincing. And most of this centers on the so-called 19 hijackers, the guys with Arab names who supposedly hijacked planes on 9-11. When I began studying the anthrax attacks, it never occurred to me, because I didn't know anything about the anthrax attacks, never occurred to me that these 19 hijackers would show up in connection with the anthrax attacks. But in fact, they do. Um, so, for example, you have uh, a couple of guys in Florida, Al Shehi and uh, Al Hamzi, who have uh, a real estate agent uh, named Gloria Irish, who turns out to be directly related to the anthrax attacks. You know, um, her husband works at the first place that is attacked essentially by anthrax in Florida. And this, you kind of go, how could this be? How could it be that um, that there's a linking person here directly between anthrax and 9-11? So you look more deeply, and you find it's a whole series of events, technology, and what I would call scenarios that connect the two. Uh, this is scenario-based politics, essentially. Somebody has gone around, and they have dreamed up what we might call dramatic uh, episodes or scenarios. And, sorry, go ahead, Lars. Uh, well, uh, there was one scenario, I think, uh, that has to do with the question, were there concerns about anthrax before the anthrax attacks took place? And I am referring here to Dark Winter. Can you talk about this, please? Yes, well, Dark Winter was a military exercise or simulation, um, such as they conduct, you know, militaries conduct these exercises all the time. What would we do if such and such happened? Let's simulate it. Let's, let's create an exercise. So this was in June of 2001, a few months before the actual anthrax attacks occurred. Uh, it took place at Andrews Air Force Base, and it was supposed to simulate a bioweapon attack on the United States. Now, in the June exercise, called Dark Winter, it was smallpox, not anthrax. But there were a number of quite striking similarities. Actually, I list 10 in my book between this exercise and the actual events. I'll just mention a few of them here. Um, first of all, the dark winter attacks involved anonymous letters being sent to the media, which is interesting because that, of course, is exactly what happened uh, when the anthrax attacks began. Secondly, Osama bin Laden is mentioned almost immediately as a suspect. Well, how interesting is that? This is well before 9-11. And, of course, he's a men mentioned immediately after 9-11 as a possible suspect when the anthrax attacks begin. Thirdly, uh, in the dark winter exercise, it turns out that, guess what? Uh, a group based in Afghanistan, clearly they're referring to al-Qaeda, is uh, the group that is said to have delivered these uh, the bioweapon, and they are said to have acquired it from Iraq. This is all, I'm talking about the military exercise now, dark winter. And this exact same um, two perpetrators, I call it the double perpetrator, shows up in the anthrax attacks. Very, very strenuously during October 2001, U.S. authorities are trying to get us to believe that Al-Qaeda delivered these letters, but that they got the anthrax spores from their state supplier, namely Iraq. So I thought it was fascinating that the same two perpetrators showed up in June. Uh, another one would be this restriction of civil rights in the dark winter exercise. It said, well, you know, we might have to... Uh, impose a whole bunch of measures restricting uh, the, citizen, the rights of U.S. citizens, rights to free assembly, um, travel restrictions, um, suspension of due process in arrest and trial, possibility of using military trials instead of civilian trials. And, of course, a lot of these things actually happened. 
Uh, and this, this is what was, again, strenuously pushed in October. Both the Patriot Act was passed and the NSA began mass spying on civilians. And then finally, some of the people who took part in the simulation are people who played an important role a few months later, less than three months later, in fact, when the actual anthrax attacks began. And I give examples of several of those people in my book. So um, you can't help but wonder whether <laughs> dark winter is to some extent a practice for what they then proceeded to do. Yeah, I would like to ask you about uh, one participant, which was uh, Judith Miller from the New York Times. Can you talk about her case, please? Yes, well, Judith Miller played a role in Dark Winter. She played a reporter, which, of course, is exactly what she was. She was a well-known New York Times reporter. And over the next couple of years, um, you know, leading up to the invasion of Iraq, she played a very important role. In fact, she started it several years before 2001 and continued it right up to the invasion of Iraq, namely uh, <coughs> framing Iraq for all kinds of crimes. Uh, and she had co-authored with two other people a book called Germs, which came out, again, beautiful timing, in, in October of 2001, at the same time the Patriot Act was being pressured and pushed through Congress, a book which talks about the danger of bioweapons attacks, and again talks about Iraq, 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 Iraq. She's constantly framing Iraq. She played a very important role in mobilizing the U.S. population uh, against Iraq. And she, she, also, she and her colleagues also talk in that book about the fact that Iraq might not, you know, directly attack the U.S. with a bioweapon, but they could use a surrogate. They could use, in other words, another group, an intermediary, to carry it out. Well, guess what? That's the narrative that, be, that begins to be pushed in October. And Judith Miller plays a role in that, you know? Namely, that Al-Qaeda has done this, but they got it from Iraq, so ultimately we have to attack Afghanistan, because that's where Al-Qaeda is based, and we have to attack, or attack Iraq. So Miller is really in the thick of things. And then to top it all off, <laughs> in October she gets her own, <clears throat> her own letter um, in her uh, New York Times office uh, with powder and a warning. Turns out it's not real anthrax, it's fake anthrax. But for reasons I won't get into here, it's fairly technical. I don't think this is a casual letter sent by somebody who didn't like uh, her reporting. I think this letter was directly part of the anthrax attacks. It was part of the operation. And, of course, when she got that letter, it gave her a chance to say, Oh, dear, you know, I've been targeted, and, and it may help make her book a bestseller. And so, frankly, she's a very suspect character. Um, she bears some responsibility for the invasion of Iraq. And there she is already in, in June 2001 practicing some of this stuff in dark winter. Another participant was Jerome Hauer. Who is this fellow and why is he of interest? <laughs> He's kind of a complex character, Jerome Hauer. Um, he, trained, he, he had some training in uh, uh, bioweapons attacks, um, and bioweapons warfare in Johns Hopkins University, with which he remained connected. Uh, he also has a direct connect, connection to the 9-11 attacks uh, because he was the guy who was the head of Giuliani's uh, emergency uh, office in World Trade Center 7, which was supposed to handle all kinds of emergencies for New York, including terrorist attacks. Uh, he was ahead of that for several years, <clears throat> not on 9-11 itself, uh, as I recall, he had resigned or been replaced a little bit before that, but he played a, cru a, a crucial role in the whole operation, and some say that he played a, a role in helping to uh, make sure it was situated in World Trade 7. Well, of course, uh, we know what happened to that, <laughs> that yep. center. It, it was abandoned immediately on 9-11, and the whole building came down, yeah. uh, World Trade 7, without having been hit by a plane. And Howard is on TV. He, on 9-11, he's on TV uh, on 9-11 saying, well, you know, I'm, I've heard some reports that World Trade 7 is unstable. And, um, well, sure enough, it comes down a little bit later. I mean, this is all already extremely fishy, quite apart from anthrax attacks. 
Um, <clears throat> no building like that had ever, ever come down in history before from fire. Yet here is Howard predicting it hours before. Um, so, and he plays a similar role in the anthrax attacks, you know, framing uh, Muslims and, and um, relentlessly pushing the global war on terror, um, helping to establish that new framework. So, to, to find Jerome Hauer <laughs> showing up in the dark winter exercise in June was another uh, enlightening experience for me. Another uh, very fishy guy played a role in, in both parts of the operation in the fall of 2001, in there practicing with the best of them. Was Jerome Hauer also uh, part of Tripod 2? This uh, war game exercise that was scheduled for September 12, 2001 in New York and was it, already prepared on 9-11? That's true, it was. Barbara Honegger has talked about that a little. I haven't studied Tripod 2, Lars, so I can't say. Mm. Uh, I, sus I suspect he was part of it, but I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure. Okay. Uh, let us now talk about the anthrax attacks. How did they contribute to get the Patriot Act passed? Yes, well, uh, I guess the simplest way to answer that is to say that the uh, that Congress was frightened on 9-11. They fled, right? I mean, they fled from the U.S. Capitol and scattered all over the place because it was said that a plane was coming toward them. And they were kept in a state of fear and intimidation from that point on, actually from September 11th till pretty nearly the end of October. So first they were, they were said to have been uh, targeted by the terrorists who did 9-11. And then the word came out uh, through the mass media and through U.S. intelligence, especially the FBI, that, oh my God, we have, now we have to be worried about um, a second strike. You know, the people that did 9-11 are probably going to do another thing. <clears throat> and they might target Congress. So, you know, target, you know, Congress is uh, um, surrounded by yellow police tape, and Congress members are told they shouldn't wear their little badges, their pins in public that identify them as members of Congress. They shouldn't have license plates that identify them as members of Congress. In other words, they have to be scared that they're going to be targeted. And this then becomes more and more specific, this threat. And remember, I'm talking about the phase now before we know that anthrax is being sent. You know, during the, in other words, and we didn't discover till that anthrax was in play till the first diagnosis on October 3rd, 2001. But between 9-11 and October 3rd, there was already all this advance warning that, oh my God, they're going to attack us now with biological weapons or chemical weapons. And they might especially choose to attack Congress. So Congress was kept in this constant state of fear. And it was all pretty blatant. There was nothing subtle about this. So the um, John Ashcroft, who was uh, uh, head of the Department of Justice, was repeatedly telling Congress, you know, okay, you need to pass this new legislation, which eventually be called, became called the Patriot Act, which restricts civil rights of Americans, give a, gives intelligence agencies more power to spy, um, you've got to pass it, and you've got to pass it right away, and don't spend too much time reading it or thinking about it. Just get it through there, because if you don't, you know, it'll be your fault <laughs> if we're attacked. And uh, and they, they kept it up, and, and then it became very specific. It became, you know, because Congress wasn't moving quite as quickly as the executive branch wanted them to. So then, um, you know, Dick Cheney, the vice president, announced that, October 4th was, was his new deadline. He wanted this new legislation passed both by um, House of Representatives and the Senate by October 4th. Well, on October 2nd, two Democratic senators rebelled against this and said this is moving too quickly. And their names were Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy. And within a few days after that, both of them had been sent anthrax letters. And yes. so, yeah, and so this, this is what happened, what happened, and this is what continued to happen through October. Uh, for example, on October 11th, the FBI gave this big warning, oh my God, oh my God, it's going to be an attack, it's imminent. And so that very day, the Senate passed 
uh, the legislation. And then finally, the, the whole thing was signed into law on October 26th by George Bush. And, w and he gave a little speech in which he gave, he gave the anthrax attacks as one of the things they were worried about. So the connection between anthrax and the passing of the Patriot, Patriot Act is very, very close. Do we actually know uh, who has written the uh, Patriot Act? Well, uh, I can't give the names of people who wrote it, no. But the um, a lot of the Patriot Act had been around for years. Uh, there had been an attempt to pass many of those measures right after the Oklahoma bombings, the Mira building that was bombed in Oklahoma a few years earlier. And, uh, and basically, Congress had resisted. And that legislation was weakened or gutted or rejected to the point where, you know, the intelligence agencies didn't get the powers they wanted. And this time, that is after 9-11, they appear to have been determined to get it through. And so they renamed it and repackaged it and strengthened it and really rammed it through as quickly as they could. Because, you know, the research we have suggests that when people are scared and traumatized by an event like 9-11 or anthrax, they will for a while give up certain civil rights and they will um, give their approval for wars of aggression and so on but the effect is often quite temporary and uh, I believe that was part of the reason for the anthrax attacks that you know if you're going to keep up that that state of tension and fear after 9-11 you have to have another attack and you have to make people feel scared and vulnerable and um, It's quite possible that if the anthrax attacks hadn't happened to immediately follow up the 9-11 attacks, the Patriot Act would have not gone through again because the, the Democrats were in a position in the Senate to reject that legislation. Yeah, but uh, you mentioned in your book that the two senators were um, for the Patriot Act, basically, but they wanted to slow down the process. Yes. Uh, when I first began to study this for my book, I thought, you know, I had heard people say before that Leahy and Daschle had been targeted because they opposed the Patriot Act. And I, I looked into it and I thought, they didn't oppose the Patriot Act. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to blame these guys. They, it's probably no, not a surprise that they, uh, they couldn't imagine, I'm sure, that this attack could have come from their own government. So, um, But regardless of whether they're to blame or not, the fact is that they approved of the act itself. They said, yes, 9-11 was a terrible thing. Yes, we need this legislation. Yes, we will work with you. We will work with the government. We will work with the Department of Justice. We will help you get this passed through Congress. But they weren't prepared to completely rubber stamp it. They wanted to change parts of it. They wanted to revise. They wanted to slow down. And, of course, what I think happened was that the key people in the executive branch who were responsible for the anthrax attacks um, were feeling, you know, if this is slowed down, it might not go through at all. Because quite rapidly, opposition to this uh, Patriot Act stuff began, both in the Senate and the House of Representatives and in the population at large. All kinds of groups, from the left to the right politically, were beginning to organize and, and resist this. So I think there was a, a sense that we have to move very quickly to get this through or we may never get it through. And that's why these guys were targeted. I think. And uh, why did the Bush-Cheney administration want the Patriot Act? Well, it, it gave more power to... Um, the executive branch, and that includes major intelligence agencies. It gave more power to the FBI, it gave more power to the CIA, it gave more power to the NSA, it gave more power to the president and vice president. Basically, the U.S. Constitution is trying to achieve a balance among the three branches of government, but what you see in 2001, it's often, it's often referred to as a coup, um, One way to look at it is the executive branch essentially threatening to kill the legislative branch, uh, first on 9-11 and then in the anthrax attacks, and, and frightening it and bullying it into giving up 
some of its own power, which again, had already been weakened by then, and, uh, and increasing its own power. So another way to look at it, of course, is just to say the military intelligence industrial complex, this vast array of well-funded sources in the U.S., took this opportunity to increase its strength. Mm -hmm. but, but the official story was that it was a failure, for example, related to the intelligence uh, agencies, and so they have to expand, they have to get bigger. And this is one of the similarities to, related to the JFK assassination, because uh, that was one of the recommendations back then too, right? Yes, uh, there are many similarities actually to this phase of the global war on terror and to the numerous assassinations that happened in the United States in the 1960s. And uh, I think that the 9-11 uh, Commission report and associated documents are even weaker and even less convincing than the Warren report was in the 1960s. So I'm not sure how we get people to to see this, but that's, that's our task, yes. Yeah. Okay, what evidence was ever presented to make the case against Al-Qaeda and or Iraq with regards to the anthrax attacks in the United States? Well, it was a combination of weak circumstantial evidence and um, fraud, basically. Um, outright lies in some cases. Um, we were led to believe that Al-Qaeda had tried to get a hold of anthrax, either to make its own or to get it from someone else. There was never any good evidence of that. We were told that Iraq had stockpiles of anthrax. Well, that's it's true that Iraq had anthrax at one point, but it had destroyed it after the 1991 war and had even destroyed the equipment needed to remake it a few years after that. Um, so this was this was major fraud in which U.S. intelligence was in, deeply involved. We were told at one point, and ABC News was the source of this, um, <clears throat> in, uh, I guess it was late October 2001, ABC News told us that um, bentonite had been discovered by scientists in the anthrax Uh, bentonite is a particular kind of clay that Iraq had uh, supposedly used to help prepare anthrax spores as a weapon. Um, and so, because that was dis and a distinctively Iraqi method of weaponization, ABC said, uh, the presence of bentonite in the anthrax is kind of Saddam Hussein's signature, so to speak. So this was a big deal. Again, it was a complete lie. There was no bentonite in the anthrax, and ABC eventually had to back off. And But when they first presented that story, they were very adamant that, that they had got this from multiple independent high-level sources. So, of course, we would like to know who those sources were, because uh, as Glenn Greenwald said years ago, if, if we knew who ABC sources were, we would probably know who carried out the anthrax attacks. So this is the kind of fraud that was used to implicate Iraq um, and that was used to implicate Al-Qaeda and, and, of course, those silly letters themselves, death to America, you know, death to Israel, um, those were crude, crude forgery. I mean, you know, this was, a, this was like a Hollywood caricature of an Islamic extremist. Um, we don't have any shred of evidence than any Muslim of any kind <laughs> wrote those letters. Those letters were part of the fraudulent operation. The source of the anthrax attacks was an American military biolab. Uh, what is the name and how uh, uh, did anybody found out about this? Well, um, what the FBI claims to be true is not, in my opinion, true. But at least I have the pleasure of agreeing with the FBI on a couple of things. First of all, yes, I think the FBI and I both agree that it came from a laboratory, highly secure laboratory in the United States that served the military and intelligence communities. Absolutely. And before we go any further, uh, let me just say a couple of things about the evidence for that. Mainly it had to do first with the strain of anthrax, the particular type of anthrax used. It's called the Ames strain. 
Um, it was first collected in the United States in 1981, the Ames strain, and most of the labs that had it in the world were American. There were a few outside the U.S., but the FBI investigated all that, decided no, that this had come from the from inside the U.S. Then there was the method of preparation of the spores, because you know, in its natural state, anthrax isn't all that dangerous. You, you know, it's I mean, it's lethal, but it's not lethal in the sense that you would use it as a weapon of mass destruction. So you have to cultivate it in a particular way um, to get, you know, refine it and have the spores a certain size and to have them float through the air. So you have to turn the uh, <coughs> spore preparation into a kind of aerosol so that it floats around like smoke. This isn't easy to do. And there are various ways of doing it, and this had the signature of the U.S. method again. So for various reasons, it became clear quite quickly, actually. By the end of 2001, it was clear that this came from somehow within the U.S. program, within the U.S. bioweapons program. Now, the only question then is, which lab did it come from? And there are three main suspects. One is USAMRIT, which is a U.S. Army um, Research Institute in Fort Detrick, Maryland, and that's where the FBI says it came from. Another is Battelle Memorial Institute, which is a private institute that works, does a lot of work for the CIA. Um, so that's, in effect, intelligence. And the third is Dugway Proving Ground, which is U.S. military. And uh, th the main thing I disagree with the FBI about is I don't think this came directly from Fort Detrick, Maryland. I think it came from either Battelle or Dugway. But we don't perhaps need to get into that argument here because regardless of which place you choose, this was, if you like, an inside job. It came from the very heart of the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> bioweapons program. And whoever took it and or prepared it or whatever they did to put it before they put it into letters was committing um, you know, not only attempted murder, but major fraud. They were carrying out a false flag operation. They were pretending to be Muslims. They were be pretending to be connected to 9-11. They were this and they were that. So, um, so yeah, it's not that difficult to track it down to the U.S. program. And this was done pretty rapidly. What has to be said about the suspects that were presented by the FBI to the public, Stephen Hetfield and Bruce Iwins? Yes, well, the first thing that we need to say here is that um, once the official story fell apart, which it was starting to by the end of October, I mean, shortly after the Patriot Act was signed into law, the official story about Al-Qaeda and Iraq as perpetrators began to crumble. Uh, there was no evidence. All, all the evidence was, was fake and it was fraud. It was starting to, to crumble. So the FBI had a real job on its hand. You have to remember that the FBI is, was given jurisdiction. It was the agency that had the power to investigate this, just as it was the same agency that had the authority and the power to investigate 9-11. So we have to concentrate on the FBI here. So what did they do? Well, they claim to have considered all options, but if you actually look at, what they, at their own record of what they did, they pretty quickly start looking for a lone wolf perpetrator. We hear a lot about lone wolf perpetrators these days. In other words, a single individual who was responsible for this. And because it became clear it was from within the U.S. kind of military intelligence community that this had come, <clears throat> obviously choosing a, a lone person, and especially a lone nut, somebody who you can claim is unbalanced or eccentric in some way, serves the purpose of covering the tracks of the real perpetrators. You can limit the damage. You can say, well, you know, it was just a bad apple, it's an unusual individual, we found him, we got him, end of story. <clears throat> of course, if it, if it became clear that it wasn't a lone individual, that it was a well-funded <clears throat> group or network that was doing this, it would be an entirely different situation. And of course, that's what I argue that it was in my book. It wasn't a lone individual. Anyway, they, they chose Stephen Hatfield first. They actually chose two scientists, one after the other. First was Stephen Hatfield, but he fought back. 
and he successfully sued them for over $5 million because they didn't have any good evidence that he had done it. And when that fell apart, the FBI went hunting again. And then in 2008, they decided that they were going to go after Bruce Ivins, Dr. Bruce Ivins, who was a well-respected um, anthrax researcher at Fort Detrick, Maryland. He'd been working to develop a uh, sorry, an anthrax vaccine. And, you know, Ivins had been known. I mean, it's not like he was a mystery man. He had cooperated with the FBI and their investigation. He wanted to help. He wanted to do his best. But they eventually decided to go after him. And uh, <clears throat> shortly before they were going to try to have him charged by a grand jury in 2008, he died. And, of course, that was of great benefit to the FBI. They could immediately say, oh, how wonderful, um, this just shows, you know, he, they, they claim he killed himself, which he may have, uh, it's quite possible, he was emotionally um, unstable and at that point in great anxiety, having been chosen as the anthrax killer. So the FBI said, oh, well, he killed himself, which just shows his guilt, you know. He had a sense of guilt, um, so he took his own life, and end of story. So uh, it took them a couple of years, but in 2010 they officially closed the case, and uh, you can find their record of that, um, their case against Bruce Ivan, Ivan's on the internet, so-called a Marathrax investigation. Now, in my opinion, it's, it's never been anything more than a laughably weak case against Ivan's. I mean, I think he's completely framed. I think he's in, an innocent man. And I think if he had lived and this had gone to court, the FBI would have been disgraced because Ivan's had a pretty good lawyer, Paul Kemp, and I think he could have made mincemeat out of them in court. But, of course, he didn't live. He died. And when you have an alleged perpetrator who dies, then the uh, intelligence agencies are very happy because they can say what they want. Um, this happened, this is another case of, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald was the same. If he had lived, who knows what would have happened, but he died. And therefore... The Warren Commission could write whatever nonsense it wanted. Um, they wouldn't be cross-examined. They wouldn't be subjected to hard questioning. They could cherry-pick whatever evidence they wanted. And exactly the same thing has happened with Bruce Ivins. Whether he killed himself or was helped along by someone else, I don't know. But either way, it was a great benefit to the FBI. Uh, you've mentioned anthrax vaccines. Uh, were there not some people uh, given drugs against the effects of anthrax before the anthrax attacks occurred? Uh, yes, it wasn't a vaccine you're, you're talking about now, mm -hmm. but it was an antibiotic, Cipro. Um, Cipro is a strong antibiotic and it was the main one recommended against anthrax, against the disease called anthrax at the time. And this is one of many uh, kind of fishy <laughs> events in the history of the anthrax attacks. Um, in other words, you and I wouldn't be surprised to find that people started running to their drugstores and buying Cipro um, after October 3rd when, when it was first uh, announced that somebody had pulmonary anthrax. But the interesting thing is that the run on Cipro, that is to say the great many people who ran, ran out to buy it, started before October 3rd, about two weeks before. In other words, just so that our listeners understand, <clears throat> somebody put anthrax letters in the mail about a week after 9-11, but nobody was supposed to have known about that or discovered that until October 3rd. And yet, in between there, in between 9-11 and October 3rd, not only are there many warnings in the press about anthrax attacks, but there is a huge run on Cipro. People are running to the pharmacy and buying this um, antibiotic, and they're doing it quite specifically because of anthrax threats and wor worries and fears. And this is the kind of foreknowledge that is uh, very suspect and makes us wonder what's going on. And we become even more suspect when we realize that George Bush and Dick Cheney were put on Cipro on 9-11 itself, the very day of 9-11, and were kept on it. 
And when we discovered that journalist Richard Cohen uh, is on record as saying that uh, he, w he was given a tip by some high government official shortly after 9-11 uh, that he should start taking Cipro. And so he did. And, and this, he said, was well before most people knew anything about Cipro. So we have to assume it was somewhere between September 11th and, say, September 23rd. He goes on Cipro because he gets a tip from somebody in government. What on earth can this mean? Because anthrax is being sent through the mails at that time, but nobody is supposed to know that, right? It hasn't been discovered yet. So um, all this whole, the whole story of Cipro here is, um, uh, it, it illustrates that there was profound foreknowledge, that, that there was a wide group of people who knew that these anthrax attacks were taking place. You argue, uh, actually, you argue in your book that members of the executive branch of the U.S. government had the anthrax attacks carried out in accordance with a plan. How did you reach that conclusion? Yes. Uh, well, it seemed to me that, uh, first of all, there's no way a lone perpetrator, a lone wolf attacker could have done all the things that were done in the anthrax attacks. You have to remember that stories were planted all over the place. Uh, Washington Post, New York Times, many, many little newspapers. Um, the Guardian, you know, in the UK. Uh, TV stations all over the place. Before the anthrax attacks even uh, were discovered, all these reports about the fear of anthrax, the threat of anthrax, all of it based on fraudulent intelligence. Uh, it seems to me that this would have taken high-level people and it would have taken multiple people. No pathetic lone wolf perpetrator could have made the media carry all those stories. Secondly, no pathetic lone wolf perpetrator could have written all the speeches for members of the executive in which warnings were given, again, before the anthrax attacks were actually discovered. Warnings were given that we may be about to, to be attacked with a biological weapon. Who wrote the speech for Donald Rumsfeld or for Andrew Card, you know, or for Tommy Thompson or for, you know, John Ashcroft? All these guys were out there in public talking about, oh my God, you know, we may be on the verge of being hit with a biological weapon attack. Um, again, this shows multiple perpetrators and it shows people in high positions of power because this was not based on good intelligence. As I show in the book, this was based on fraudulent intelligence. Al-Qaeda didn't have anthrax. Iraq didn't have anthrax, okay? Now, some people come along and they say, oh, well, but it was, it, was, it was partially good intelligence because after all the attacks took place. And I say, no, that won't work. Because when the anthrax attacks took place, they were done by completely different people than these other guys had been predicting, and therefore for completely different purposes. So, um, so what do we see? We see multiple people. We see high-level people. We see, and I try to show in my book that this was coordinated with other initiatives taking place, including the Patriot Act, the NSA spying, the discarding of the anti-ballistic missile treaty with the uh, former Soviet Union. All these things were taking place. This was coordinated. Um, all these things were tied together. And, um, and again, all the evidence that the 19 hijackers who were involved in 9-11 were also being involved in all these strange little scenarios that had to do with anthrax. They were supposedly running around trying to get a hold of a crop duster plane so that they could spread biological weapons over the U.S. The same guys who did 9 who were supposed to have done 9-11. Uh, so all of this, you know, there's no Bruce Ivins or Stephen Hatfield or anybody who could have done all this created false scenarios, planted false stories, written false speeches, coordinated this with major treaties the U.S. was rejecting. It all points to powerful people in positions of, you know, um, where they could accomplish this. And I realize, of course, that people will say, oh, well, in other words, you think it was a conspiracy. You're a conspiracy theorist. And that's precisely true. It was a conspiracy. It's exactly what I'm saying in this book. Mm-hmm. 
But I w wanted to ask you uh, about this uh, specifically, how you would uh, respond if our listeners, readers, dismiss your research as just another wacky conspiracy theory. Well, um, the term conspiracy theory is what I refer to as a thought stopper. In other words, it doesn't provoke us to think, it doesn't stimulate thought, it doesn't open up a discussion, it doesn't encourage us to have a debate. What it tries to do is to stop the discussion. Um, it's an anti-intellectual move. It basically says, here's a person who is either um, immoral or stupid or insane, they're a conspiracy theorist, we're not going to engage in dialogue with them. We're going to just going to paint them with a brush. They're tainted. They're spoiled. They're taboo. Somehow they're outside the circle of respectable society. And therefore, we don't have to listen to them. We don't have to look at their evidence. We don't have to read their books. We can just push them outside the circle. That's what the term conspiracy theorist does. And that's what I think it's mainly designed to do. It came into popularity after the... Uh, JFK assassination and has been very useful uh, for governments and intelligence agencies ever since then. The sad thing is that even, you know, people that I personally respect a great deal, especially people on the left, often uh, buy into this whole way of thinking. So where is Mr. Chomsky on 9-11? Where is wonderful Chris Hedges and Glenn Greenwald and Amy Goodman? Uh, all these people who are so important in North America right now, and whom I do not demonize, by the way. I respect them all. I think they're doing good work. But where are they on 9-11? Where are they on the anthrax attacks? Well, they're missing. And they seem to have accepted the idea that those of us who, who question the official story on this are somehow radically wrong. We're somehow tainted. We're outside the boundaries of thinkable thought. And, uh, and that's too bad. So what I did uh, in my book, I thought, well, I could run away from this term or I could run directly toward it. I could embrace it. And that's what I decided to do. And that's why the subtitle of the book is deliberately The Case for a Domestic Conspiracy. And I define conspiracy in my introduction. It's simply a plan, by, uh, a plan made in secret by two or more people to commit an immoral or illegal act. Now, conspiracies, in that sense, happen all the time. That's why laws are designed to deal with them. Um, you know, so there's nothing weird about the fact that I'm claiming there was a conspiracy. What it comes down to is evidence. Do I have the evidence to support my argument? And if a person wants to know, they'll have to read the book because the devil is in the details. Yeah. Um, if our uh, listeners are interested in what you were referring, I think there was uh, a memo in 1967 related to the um, case of Jim Garrison in New Orleans, where the CIA said we should use the term conspiracy theory instead of assassination theory. Okay, uh, the final question would be, you conclude your book with the chapter The Unthinkable. What do you mean with that? Yes, <clears throat> well, um, this is how that um, you know, part of the investigation proceeded. I noticed when I was reading the newspapers of the time, that is, uh, the newspapers that were dealing with the anthrax attacks, back in the fall of 2001, that the term the unthinkable kept coming up again and again. Um, people would say, is it really true that the unthinkable is happening in the United States? Or they would say, it seems like a bioweapon attack is finally happening. happening. We must now think the unthinkable. And, you know, if you bump into one or two references like that, you know, it's no big deal. But I kept coming <laughs> kept coming up with it again and again and again. And it wasn't just journalists, because, of course, journalists borrow from other journalists. If it was just journalists, you'd say, oh, well, the guy in the New York Times likes, likes the way the Washington Post did that, so he's going to borrow it. But it wasn't that simple, because there were also scientists, there were government leaders. Everybody seemed to be joining in the chorus. <clears throat> and so I thought I would look a little more deeply into it. Now, of course, I was aware that the term, the unthinkable, has had a kind of a code, it's been kind of a code word for decades. 
um, in among those who are concerned with nuclear weapons. And it, refer, it, it was used for a long time to refer to nuclear warfare, the unthinkable. Um, this use of the term was probably pioneered, as far as I know, by Herman Kahn, who was a, an American strategic thinker, um, a guy who used game theory and so on to figure out how the U.S. could best um, play this game more, most fruitfully with the Soviet Union. And he isn't, wrote, he, isn't he the original role model for Dr. Strangelove? <laughs> it, it could quite quite possibly be. There, yeah. there are a number of people who've been claimed. <laughs> yes, yes. Including Henry Kissinger, but Khan, Khan was certainly, uh, in some ways, a rather horrific <laughs> figure. Um, anyway, he wrote a book thinking about the unthinkable. And from that point on, all kinds of people used the term to refer to nuclear warfare. So I thought, well, that's interesting. They're now using it to refer to a bioweapons attack. Is there any deep meaning here? Uh, is this important? Now, to this day, I'm not really sure what the answer to that is. This is a relatively speculative chapter. But I did find a number of things that interested me. First of all, um, in 2001, George Bush rejected the anti-ballistic missile treaty. Um, by that I mean he gave the Soviet Union, well, Russia now, he gave Russia warning that the U.S. was going to unilaterally withdraw from that extremely important treaty. Um, and the speech he gave in May 1st, 2001, so this is months before the anthrax attacks, was quite interesting to me. He says, you know, the, the Cold War is over, so forget about, you know, U.S. and Soviet Union fighting each other. Soviet Union was a terrible, evil thing, of course, but it's gone. Um, and we don't have to worry about that anymore, so... Uh, nuclear weapons aren't really a major threat for the U.S. anymore. The major threat is terrorism and rogue states possessing weapons of mass destruction. And in this context, in this, so what he's really doing is announcing publicly that we're going to change the global conflict framework, um, the 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 framework that will divide all of humanity. Essentially, it was the Cold War for decades, and now it's going to be a new one. And he didn't actually call it the global war on terror, but he, he, he was giving us warning that that's what was going to be. This is a few months before the attacks of the fall. So 9-11 hasn't happened, anthrax haven't happened. But these are the new dangers, he says. And when he's describing the new dangers, he says, we need to rethink the unthinkable, which I thought was an interesting phrase. So the unthinkable had been nuclear war before, and now we have to rethink it. So now the unthinkable is terrorism and rogue states with weapons of mass destruction. Okay, well, that's really interesting. So then, the end, you know, 9-11 happens, which is supposedly terrorism, and the anthrax attacks happen, which were initially said to be an attack by we with a weapon of mass destruction by a rogue state, namely Iraq. Well, how interesting. Uh, and then we have all these journalists and leaders and everybody talking about, oh, the unthinkable is, <laughs> the unthinkable is here, the unthinkable has happened. Um, and to top it all off, we then had a letter uh, which was sent in September to NBC um, and which was uh, part of this general thing we call the anthrax attacks, although the powder in it was fake uh, for reasons I give in my book. I believe it was part of the anthrax text. And this letter starts off with the words, the unthinkable, <laughs> printed in big, you know, capital letters and spelled wrong to look like an illiterate Muslim or something. <laughs> an illiterate, uh, what do they call them now, radical or uh, extremist. Um, and I thought, well, this is interesting. So here we have the anthrax attacks, a letter is being sent out to the mass media saying, the unthinkable has arrived, basically. And we have George Bush warning several months later that we need to rethink the unthinkable. And we have all these journalists and government leaders talking about the unthinkable. So it occurred to me that just maybe, just possibly, this expression, the unthinkable, may be part of the discourse or the rhetoric of this new global conflict framework, that we're being given a message here. <clears throat> we're being told that the the that which could not be thought, that which is so evil that our poor little ordinary minds can't grasp it, or at least our democratic Western minds, right? We can't grasp it. It used to be nuclear war, 
and our, we had the evil adversary in the Soviet Union. And now that switch, now the ultimate evil is these dangerous Muslim guys uh, who are our enemy in the global war on terror. And, and they're going to use, they don't have nuclear weapons, but they're going to use the best they have, which is biological and chemical weapons. And so now this is the unthinkable. And this, our poor little humane kind of rational Western minds can't quite come to grips with this. This is beyond us. So we call it the unthinkable. And, and, uh, and you know, so we have to throw ourselves into the arms of our, our government leaders to protect us from this horrible evil. And I think that's what's going on. Uh, as I said before, there's a certain amount of speculation in my interpretation here. But, you know, I give the evidence and people can make of it what they will. Okay, Graham, uh, do you have uh, five minutes? Sure. More? Okay, great. Because I know um, there's one thing that you took a look at. Um, well, a few weeks ago, the Senate uh, released the report on the CIA torture program. Yeah. And uh, you are aware that the core of the 9-11 story is based on torture testimony. Can you yes. talk about this, please? Because this is very, very crucial. Yes, I actually mentioned this, Lars, when I, uh, maybe this is what you're referring to. Um, I, I was part of a press conference at the Parliament buildings in Ottawa, in my country's capital, um, not too long ago, when we uh, had managed to get a petition presented to our parliament to conduct uh, an independent review of the 9-11 attacks. And the day that I got up to give that uh, talk in the press conference, the House of Parliament, uh, the Senate report on torture was in the news and everybody was talking about it and it was being discussed in Canadian Parliament and so on. So I decided that even though I only had about three minutes for my little speech, I would mention the torture connection because as you say it's extremely important. Uh, the first thing to be said here is that there's nothing uh, outside the mainstream, uh, there's nothing particularly radical or controversial about the statement that that torture was crucial to that 9-11 Commission report. In fact, I believe it was NBC, NBC, of all things, who commissioned the study that discovered that over one quarter, over one-fourth of the footnotes in the 9-11 Commission report were based on these interrogations. And, of course, we know that many of those interrogations involve the use of torture, such as suffocating people with water, And if you look at the footnotes of, of the commission report, you, well, I certainly was stunned years ago when I first read it by all the references, you know, KSM, KSM, KSM. Mm -hmm. uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was supposedly suffocated about 183 times. So the 9-11 um, Commission not only used um, information gathered under torture, it made it central to the report. Chapters five and six of the report Uh, couldn't be written, at least in their current form, without these interrogations. So it has to do with Osama bin Laden and his group deciding to carry out these attacks and the nature of the attacks and how Al-Qaeda came to the U.S. and where they went and what their names were. All kinds of things that are central to the official story were supposedly gathered through these harsh interrogations. And the 9-11 Commission report collaborated with this. They actually submitted a, round, a new round of, of a new bunch of questions um, to the CIA so that, as far as we know, these guys were interrogated harshly again, specifically to answer questions for the 9-11 Commission. Now the 9-11 Commissioners, of course, asked if they could directly talk to these poor guys who were being tortured didn't call it torture, but it's, you know, can we talk to the people who've been interrogated? Well, no, you can't. You can't see them, you can't talk to them. Well, we can, can we at least interview their interrogators? No, you can't. None of your business. Stay away. You'll, you'll interrupt the delicate process of interrogation. And so here we have um, a 9-11 commission report that has reason to believe people have been tortured to give this testimony but doesn't have direct access to anybody of any significance in the process, and so therefore decides to just trust the transcripts, the alleged transcripts that they get. It's the weakest, most flimsy, not to mention immoral and illegal kind of evidence you can imagine. 
Imagine trying to introduce that into any decent courtroom. So this is what the 9-11 Commission report, which is the closest thing to an official U.S. You know, document, giving the, um, the main story about 9-11, that's what it's based on. And this is why we're trying to make the case to the Canadian Parliament that you can't accept this. If you're saying you don't collaborate with torture, then you can't accept this document. and You have to have an independent review. I don't expect that we'll be successful anytime soon, but that's an argument we're making. Uh, does every country of the West have to make this, to ask the government to come clean about this? I absolutely think they should. I think this is really important, you know, because journalists and government leaders, uh, to the extent that they're asked about this, they usually try and distance themselves immediately from these horrible interrogation um, techniques. Uh, oh, we don't do that. Oh, we, we weren't collaborating, blah, blah, blah. And it needs to be pointed out publicly. I mean, people need to be writing this in, in op-eds and newspapers and official letters circulating in the internet. Every government has to be asked, well, then why do you accept the official story of 9-11? Because it is based on torture testimony. Everybody needs to be confronted with that. Okay, Graham, thank you for your efforts and for your book. The book is The 2001 Anthrax Deception, The Case for a Domestic Conspiracy, and it was published at Clarity Press. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you, Lars. I enjoyed it. <laughs>